My name is John Brown, Jr. I'm the second president of John Brown University. My father started this school in a cornfield. This campus was a cornfield back in 1919. Several people asked if I was named for the school. And I, I mean, if the school was named for me, and I said, no, I came along at 21, and I was named for the school. And uh, God has blessed this campus. It's really been a transition from a cornfield, I assure you that. And uh, last year, I think it was, kind of a tall lady, gal, was one of the students in the line, cafeteria line right ahead of me. And she turned around and said, what do you do around here? And I said, well, I don't do anything. She said, well, you must be one of the coaches then. <laughs> but anyway, I'm not a coach, even though uh, I enjoy the athletic program. But uh, as all of you know, in 1941, we, we went started World War II. Oh, it's in 40, I think, when it started. But anyway, in uh, uh, January the 8th of 43, I was inducted into the Naval Aviation. And because I already had my pilot's license, I was given a commission. Uh, JBU had a flying school here called the Civilian Pilot Training Program. Some of you may have heard of the CPT program. That was a program here at the school? Yeah. We, we were allowed uh, 10 uh, trainees each semester. And was that program put into place in preparation for war in the event yeah. that we went to Yeah, war? that was uh, started in 38 in, uh, or 39, I'm not sure. But I took my primary in uh, in 39, and then my secondary in 40. And then uh, in 42, I went before the Naval Aviation Selection Board in New Orleans, where I was commissioned and uh, given uh, active duty at the University of Georgia pre-flight school. Went through pre-flight for, well, actually, we didn't go clear through pre-flight. There was 10 of us. We got a refresher course and started flying then after about three weeks of pre-flight. And that course uh, led, we took uh, instrument flying and got to a point where we would have gone to Atlanta. And I had a ruptured eardrum uh, flying change of altitude every day. I had a, what they call a deviated nasal septum that blocked the back side of my ear and wouldn't release pressure, so they gave me the choice of having an operation or taking a ground assignment. And at that time, I was not ready to go under the blade of some of those Navy doctors, so I chose to take the ground assignment and was assigned as a air control officer. Now, were you, um, we'll back up a second and go back to the 30s and then we'll lead back up to the war before we do that. Um, were you disappointed when you found out that you wouldn't be a pilot? Oh yeah, I was very disappointed, but the agony of every day, you know, flying up to 15,000 feet and in, in couple of minutes be back on the ground and uh, it was uh, my ear was stopped up most of the time what, pop and the, what kind of plane did you want to fly UPF 7 they were training planes and they pretty high powered no no that's the kind of plane you wanted to fly in the that board. was a training plane oh, okay that's the kind of, we were being trained to be instructed oh okay yeah okay now we're, so were you so if you know that you're being trained to be an instructor, that means you're probably going to stay stateside, right? Well, yeah, but they rotate you around. Okay. They, you know, it probably would be a couple of years around uh, of uh, training instructor, and then you move on. So did do you remember having the thought that okay, well, I won't be an instructor now. I'm going to be a flight control officer, which means the chances that I'll get into combat are a lot higher. 
No, I didn't. I didn't give that a thought. Uh, there was no really consideration. It's just a matter of physically and mentally. It was so agonizing that I decided I, I would take to the ground. I, I probably could have gone ahead and had the op many many have operations, and, and it comes out all right. But, uh, what what year were you born? Twenty one. Nineteen twenty one. What do you remember about the, you were in this area during the Depression, I'm guessing? Oh, yeah. What do you remember about this area during the Great Depression? I was born over here where Mayfield is. Our, our old home was uh, on the side of Mayfield. And uh, my dad, of course, he, he uh, was, we worked 24 hours a day just about. And uh, he held, uh, he was, held meetings all around the country, Chattanooga, Tennessee, California, raising money through his ministry for this school. So we always had plenty to eat here at the college, but sometimes it wasn't a very, no, the fair certainly wasn't like it is today. We uh, had our own gardens here on campus and a dairy and a uh, canning plant that uh, we canned beans and lima beans and I don't know what all. But, uh, do, do you remember, I know you were young, but did the depression change the town in some way that you remember? Not really. I don't know. Now you said you were a Democrat. Does that go oh, back I was to the... Kidding. Oh, was, you're just kidding. No, I, I was serious. I, I just threw that in. Oh. Uh, yeah, uh, this was Democratic territory. We didn't know what a Republican looked like until... Uh, all the northerners started moving in. And did President Roosevelt's New Deal? But see, we had Bill Fulbright was our senator, John McClellan, and we just uh, we we had uh, a line of real outstanding people. They were fine Christian people. Back back then, you could be a Democrat and Christian at the same time. <laughs> Today, a lot of people think if you're if you're a Democrat, you can't be a Christian. Anyway, that is amazing. We just didn't have, there was everybody on the ticket in Arkansas. There was no primary. There was, uh, the was Roosevelt the primary, primary for who was going to be the Democratic <coughs> candidate? And Roosevelt was popular in oh, yeah, the yeah, very much. Yeah, he helped, he helped bring Arkansas out of poverty. What were you doing, what were you doing when you heard the news about the bombing of Pearl Harbor? My wife and I had been married. Uh, we were married in forty. And that happened. In, was it in December forty one? December seven forty one. Forty one. Yeah. And we, my dad had a farm out here in Oklahoma, and we lived on that farm. And it was Sunday afternoon, wasn't it? Because I knew we'd been to church, and we came back, and uh, we had a couple of students with us, some of my friends, and we were fixing lunch when it happened. And did you hear on the radio? Yeah, well, we had a radio, a big radio, one of those stands on the floor. What was the feeling that you had when you heard that news for the first time? Well, we've been hearing rumors of, of you know, aggression by the Japanese. And uh, when it actually happened, it was difficult to really understand how with all of our fleet out at Pearl Harbor and the, the, the uh, surveillance, surveillance of, of the Japanese fleet, how it could have happened. But we were all just stunned. By it. And you were in your early 20s at this time? Yeah, I was uh, 20. So you, did you immediately... No, I was 21. Or 21. Did you immediately make the... Did you immediately realize that, you know, the country's going to go to war and I'm going to be in it? I mean, you've been in this training program yeah, anyway. So. Yeah, I, I knew that it was eventual. It was coming. And we, had a, we had a young daughter at that time. She was born in 41, in January of 41, I don't think it was. So our, I can't remember exactly what they had But anyway, she was, uh, she was still, uh, she wasn't walking yet, so I, I had her and had, had responsibility. In fact, I, I, I had finished 
the course out at the airport and I was an assistant air force manager and, and was getting ready to do some instructing out there. But anyway, I, at the time I didn't realize what the future held at all. It was kind of uncertain. Was your wife worried? Well, if she was, she didn't show it. Uh, Caroline never showed any concern or worry. Well, concern, but not worry. When you heard about the news, you said you were stunned. Were you also angry? Yeah, I, I, I was, because I, I, I couldn't understand why, what brought that on, what would cause it. Because we were having problems in Europe, and uh, then for them to come to our back door and do that. What, what do you remember about Europe? Um, you know, you're young, and you're, you're late teens, but what do you remember about <laughs> You know, do you remember any, hearing anything in 1935, 36, 37 about this guy who's taken over Germany? And do you no, remember any really, of that kind of I was I was in school and not really paying a lot of attention to what the world knew. Did it seem like a surprise since most of the most of the vets I say, most of the vets I've talked to, they say the news <coughs> is coming from Europe, 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 and then Japan just came out of the blue. That's exactly right. That's the way it was. It was just a, a sudden surprise. Was there, did you have the feeling, or did others you know have the feeling that, you know, not only are we surprised and angry, but we want to get them back? Oh, yeah, I, I think we mainly, yeah, was we wanted to protect our shores back, yeah. Um, so you said after you decided not to get the operation, you became a, um, a, an air control officer? Ground officer. Ground yeah. officer. And what did they do? Or what did they do? Well, I was uh, reassigned to the Naval Air Station at Beaufort, South Carolina. <coughs> Any of you from North, from South Carolina, anybody knows where Beaufort is? Where Paris Island, where the Marine Corps trains. Anyway, I, I, they had a naval air station in Beaufort, and I was assigned to the naval air station in Beaufort as an air controller. And we we had an op actually operations officer. We had to have all the air control under our administration. We had the fire and rescue truck, and we had the responsibility of keeping the runway and the lights all operating. We had operations officer actually kept all of the, the uh, functions of the operation of the airport. Okay, so you're not actually in communication with the pilots controlling that, but you're more well, like I, ground operation. I, I, at times I was, I was in the tower, but very seldom as, uh, we had other men. Uh, How long were you there before you went to the Pacific? I was there uh, 16 months. So by that time it's 43? 43, yeah, 43, 40, yeah, 43, 44. I, I and, and the order comes to go to San Francisco or to Seattle or something like no, that, San Diego? I was assigned to uh, close air support at San Diego and actually it was out at Coronado Island. Yeah. And North Island, I was stationed at North Island, Coronado, where they they ran close air support missions. What does that mean, close air support? Well, the troops on the ground would call in targets, and we to us, and then we would direct air strikes, close air support strikes. So, like if you have. Uh some guys who've hit the beach and they're pinned down because of a bunker, they'll send information back to cordons of the bunker and then you send And then we communicate with the pilot, with the pilot to direct them to the, to the target. So in San Diego you did that kind of training? We did practice there. Uh, and then how long before you headed out to the war? We were there about two, or two months, I think it was. And they were, they were going to ship us out uh, two days before Christmas. And another friend of mine, who was uh, Commander Ralph Iron, he was in charge of all of us. I talked to him. I was, my folks 
we had Brown Military Academy out there in San Diego, and all my family was out there and expecting that we had no idea we'd get orders out two days before Christmas. So anyway, we went to the Admiral and played with him. That why ship us out the two days before Christmas? And darned if he didn't change the orders. We left two days after Christmas. So there is some uh, humanity in the Navy, I think. So you got on, did you get in ships from San Diego then? We went on board air carrier. Which one? Oh, God, something Bay. Uh, an aircraft carrier? An aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. Wendell Bay, I think, was the name of it. It was, well, it was one of the smaller Wendell Bay. They used those to transport airplanes and people back and forth. And did you go from there to Pearl Harbor? We went Harbor? to Pearl Harbor. Okay. And we were at Pearl Harbor about, they, that, that was the funny part. We thought Pearl Harbor, we'd get right on down. Because the operation in the Saipan and Midway, and they were they were clearing all that out. And uh, we were uh, we were talking about the operation. And, uh, let's see, there's another operation. But anyway, <coughs> when we got there, why uh, Commander Arndt went and checked us all in, and they said, uh, "What do we where do we go from here?" They said, oh, you're going over to Maui. We went over to Maui and spent two months or three months, I can't remember. They said it was a hurry up and wait deal. So we spent leisure time at uh, Maui. Maui was a beautiful island. And the air station was right out in the middle of a gold pineapple field. And uh, the gold People said, anytime you want a pineapple, just take your machete out there and take, eat all the pineapple you want. Well, we loaded up pretty well on pineapple. So you, <coughs> on, at Maui, then you kept doing training, or are you just kind of waiting? Oh, or a little oh, bit of both? No, we did that. They have a big volcano at, uh, on Maui, and they use that as target for target practice. Same blue of a volcano. So two of our squadrons. We, and then we directed, we'd go out two or three days and, and have uh, gunnery practice, put a layout panel and then direct the men on the panel. Did you go by Pearl Harbor and see the destruction there? Oh yeah, yeah. We, in fact, they put us up over at Pearl Harbor for about three days before they sent us to out. Did the war come closer to home for you when you saw that? Oh yeah. yeah. What was yeah. that? Do you remember what went three months? I had some good friends. Uh, Stuart Springfield, who was manage, business manager of the college, uh, his brother was a graduate of NASA, and he was on the Oklahoma. And, uh, of course, uh, let's see, what was the other ship that they... I, I, can't, I can't remember. What was there? The Arizona? Arizona, yeah. Anyway, the destruction out there, Hickam Field was, is still battered and having lots of problems with their, their equipment. So the war comes a little closer to home with Pearl Harbor? Well, when you see, yeah, when you see the destruction here, well, you, you realize that what they did to our people. Now, these fellows you just mentioned, they were there, did they survive? Did the it? Oh, did yeah. It? Okay. yeah. Uh, uh, Stuart Springfield, uh, it was his brother-in-law, okay. went down, and uh, but he was able to get out and survive, and came finally retired from the Navy and lived over at Fedville, <coughs> and I think about, oh, maybe five or six years later, died of a heart attack. So after your time <coughs> in Maui, then you do more training, you blow up the volcano, and yeah. and then what, then what comes next? Well, we got orders then to go to uh, Midway. No, we went to Midway, and then we went on to Saipan, where we boarded the ship, the USS Ancon. And we were really lucky, because the Ancon had been a cruise ship 
How do you spell that, Adam? A is C O B N. Okay. And uh, it had been a cruise ship that they converted to uh, a command ship. And Admiral Richmond Kelly Turner was the assault commander for Okinawa, and we were on his staff. Okay, so you're on the ship that the Admiral is on, yeah. and he has overall control. He has complete okay, control so of no. the land forces, the air forces, the assault forces, all of them. Now, what's the, I'll just show the students where we are on the map. What's the importance of the Battle of Okinawa? Let's see, where are we here? Here's Okinawa. Um, how many of you all had World War II? last year. Some of you had. The strategy, just a little bit of background and then tell us what's important about Okinawa. The U.S. strategy was to take one, you know, one island after another, getting closer and closer to Japan. It's an island hopping campaign. So that's why you have these very brutal battles on these small islands. It's so that you can build an air base on that island and then from that island planes can land, take off, and then go on to the next island. And the, and the point is to get closer and closer to Japan to carry on the air war against Japan. And also, if we have to invade Japan, then to get ready to be close enough that we could launch, or we meaning the Allies, the U.S., Canada, Britain, and so on. Okinawa was the last step before Japan. So Okinawa <coughs> is the last big step before Japan. Uh, it's extremely costly in number of lives. I don't know. I don't have the figures off the top of my head. Um, so, what is important about, about Okinawa then? Well, Okinawa was the last step, and that was where the airstrikes and the assault would, would be gathered. So, but at the same time, Okinawa was very vulnerable to the Japanese mainland, where they sent out all these kamikaze by the Now, you hear by 1944? <coughs> In, or, in Okinawa by 44, then I guess is when that, when does that battle start? That was in <coughs> March or February of 44. Are you there when the battle starts? No, we actually, the assault started about uh, three weeks before we got there. We were the original assault group. When we went over out and Admiral Turner came aboard our ship. He'd already been in the original assault group. And when you got there, did you hear about how costly this battle was? Oh, yeah. We, we were in Blue, Tennessee. We were anchored right off uh, of the coast of uh, Okinawa. And where you could you could look over on the island and see what was going on. Now, you said kamikazes were flying out from the mainland. And oh, yeah. Out the yeah, we had, we had, that was one of our we were in uh, what they called combat information center right and we had on our charts uh, the, the uh, radar for all of the air activity that we could plot to see <coughs> it was our responsibility to vector our combat air support our fighters to to the kamikaze that they were coming off to shoot the kamikaze yeah. down. Did kamikaze ever aim at your ship? It, well, it, uh, they, they tried to several times. But I'm guessing since the Admiral's on your ship, yeah. that's getting the most protection. Well, fortunately, they had the New Mexico, the big battleship, anchored close to us. And the closest we came was one evening, right, right out of the sun. Uh, three of them came right over our ship. I, yeah, I, I, I could see the face on the, one of the pilots. <coughs> and they hit the New Mexico next to it, which is anchored. All about the length of a football field from us. This was, um, these kind of suicide attacks, of course, we're, we're seeing them a lot now. Oh, yeah. But it's not a, it's not, to use the phrase, the Western way of war, no. right? And, and, the Americans, although this war in the Pacific had been extraordinarily brutal, I mean, all wars brutal, but this was much more brutal, especially for the, the soldiers on the ground. This ratchets that up even more. Um, do you remember what kind of thoughts you had about, you know, what kind of enemy is this that does this kind of thing, or 
what kind of thoughts did you have about this kind of enemy that you're dealing with? I said, Lord, if you get me back to Arkansas, I'll never leave the United States again. <laughs> I haven't done it. Uh, you stayed in the States ever since? Yeah. Well, in the well, United States. Yeah. But anyway, those are the thoughts I had. <coughs> we're going to win it. That, you know, we were close to it. And did, did, did you realize that this was an act of desperation on their part? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Out? They were in desperate. They were they were down to where they were doing anything they could. Of course, on the ground, our Marines and, and Army they were keep kept every day. They moved the enemy back until they they jumped off the cliffs at the south end of Okinawa. Why did they do that? Why did they? They would, they'd rather commit suicide than be captured. You said that when, when the one kamikaze came in and hit New Mexico, it was close enough that you could see. Yeah, we were standing out all day. It was after dinner, and uh, in the evening, we always went out there and <clears throat> just, just look around, get some fresh air. And they came out of the sun. The sun was just set. It came right across the water. There's no warning? No, no. One guy evidently aborted one of the other ships recognized them and started firing. But by that time, they were over our ship and they went into the Mexico. If that guy whose face you saw, if he could sort of be the symbol for the Japanese enemy, how did you feel about him? He, how did you perceive him? He like had a smile on his face. He looked to me like, I mean, just the impression I had. It may have been I was scared to death, but I mean, <coughs> not used to talking to us, but, but um, and he went over our our ship. Like I kind of got looked up and I thought, well, that son of a gun was grinning. He went over our ship. What happened to the New Mexico when the plane hit? Well, it, uh, I think it was something like 17. They hit uh, the turret, a couple of the turrets where there were some seven there. <coughs> Seventeen fatalities. I don't remember how many injured. <coughs> so the boat didn't sink. Uh, the boat didn't sink. Oh no, no, no. no. Yeah. The New Max went back and got repaired prepared for the invasion. How, <coughs> how long did um, did all this go on with the threat of the kamikazes before things settled down? Uh, we were we were there in the harbor of uh, uh, just off the of uh, just off the of Okinawa. Five weeks, I think. Five weeks. Five weeks of that kind of tension. Yeah. We, now, actually, we had picket ships out around Okinawa, and they were radar little radar ships, and then we had what we call combat air. And they shot down a lot of, very few of them actually got through our cover. Did you get any real sleep in those five weeks? Oh yeah, I started. Did you? I was at peace, yeah, I really did, I felt like. What, what do you, what accounts for that, being at peace? I think being a devout Christian, you know, uh, you, you can't work, the Bible says not to worry, not to be over, over, I, I just had a feeling that it was Lord will I'd be bad. It's interesting because most of the vets I've talked to, there's only one other veteran I've talked to who said something similar to that. Most, all, all the rest of the vets I've talked to, including vets who are Christians now, said that during the war, the war and the military just seems like a God-free zone. Like maybe when I got up into my plane, I would pray, I'd make a deal with God, get me back home, and I'll do such and such. But in terms of personal faith, they say it really wasn't there. But was that your experience, or did, did you know other other folks who were serious about their faith in the military, or were well, you I kind had, of alone that I day? had yeah. friends that really didn't have any faith. I had, I had a wonderful Catholic officer that was a good friend. 
he had a great faith in the city. I never questioned his, his uh, uh, faith. But, uh, he was a oh, chaplain? Huh? He was a chaplain? No, he was a chaplain. Oh, he's okay. Yeah. But one of his best friends was a Presbyterian from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And he and I supported each other a lot. And, uh, and we, we uh, had, we, uh, aboard the Ancon, we had the state room, you know, we had tile baths. And it was, it was entirely different from a warship. Right, because the admiral staff. The admiral staff, and they, they, they got the bed. Do you remember any um, chaplains who were yeah. influential? Well, down at Naval Air Station, Buford, uh, there was a chaplain down there by the name of Brown. And I used to go to his services regularly. And yet I went to the Methodist Church down there in Buford. How about in the war zone itself? Well, the only time that I actually went, we, after Okinawa, we went down to the Philippines and we were anchored in uh, Manila Bay. We went in one Sunday and went to church there, but later we were transferred to Subic Bay. <coughs> and Subic Bay was an R&R &R camp for uh, camp combat people and mainly the, the uh, sea beams who had gone in really carried the run doing a lot of things underwater. So right across from the camp was a little little Manila, probably a Philippine chap. And we used to go to that. And the, the, the preacher was able to communicate with us. But that that was about the only experience. Do you have ever had any feelings of resentment or, I don't know if grudge is the right word, against the Japanese? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, do you still now? No, I don't now. I, I don't like to buy their cars, and I, rec I recognize that they're, all, my daughter just last week bought a Toyota Sienna or something like that. But I, I have never owned a Japanese car. Is that because it's from Japan or just because it's foreign? Because it's from Japan. So there is still a little bit yeah, of that. Yeah, I'd say there's work. still lack of support there. Yeah. Um, what is your, you know, when you see pictures like this, and this is, Peter, is this Hiroshima? Yeah. This is a picture that Peter Hellman sent me a student in class here of um, Hiroshima. Of course, you know, one of the reasons that you're there in Okinawa is to get ready for a land invasion of Japan. A land invasion of Japan doesn't happen, though, because Japan surrenders August, August 15, 1945, um, as a result of the two as, as a result of the two bombs. What are your personal thoughts about the dropping of the bombs? Well, uh, after we were at Subic Bay. We went uh, back to the Admiral's staff in Manila. And Ned Hamilton and I were assigned to a, to a troop ship in charge of air, close air support up at Lingayan Gulf, that was North Gulf. And we were up there running airstrikes and running uh, invasion and landings in a huge armada getting ready for the invasion of Japan. What I saw up there convinced me that there were going to be thousands of our people lost. They were along that beach or we flew up there when we went in. I would say 50 miles <coughs> of nothing but our people hitting the beach and, and assaults in our airplanes, our support. It would have been a terrible walk. So you're so saying by I would, that the evening that the, the war ended, uh, we were all great. 
because we was a lot, there's been a lot of us that have never been back. Did, did you know at the time that the, before the surrender, the Japanese government was was telling its civilians to get ready to fight door to door with oh, kitchen yeah. knives, with anything, whatever it takes? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was going to be a difficult. And plus Okinawa had revealed how difficult, how difficult it was. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you a little personal story that Admiral Turner was a very personal guy. And he used to go up on deck, up on the upper structure. And we had several mattresses up there where we, the sun, and, you know, enjoy the sun. One day we were up there, and he said, uh, Brown, he said, uh, you, you seem to express yourself every now and then. Uh, what's your reaction to the assault on Okinawa? And I said, well, Admiral, I think it was a waste of lives. We had them completely isolated. You see the sign, of, I mean, the picture all the time of the guys raising the, which is noble and wonderful. I don't mean to detract from that. But it was so unnecessary. Okinawa had really no strategic, had no airport. There. By that time, the long-range bombers could hit Japan well, anyway. We had Taipan Midway, we had uh, uh, Guam, we had uh, we had Kwajalein, we had, uh, and then we were taking later, but that was really not support. We lost, I don't remember how many now, I think like 30,000 people on, on people. And he said, well, I'm glad to hear you say that, but he said, let's Let's don't make that official. He said, he said, let's don't let that become official from any of us. So do, do you still feel the same way that I was? Oh, yeah, same? I sure do. I saw it and I felt it at the time. And I haven't read or seen anything to change my mind. A couple last questions. Um, what's something that you want um, young people to know? About the I was going to pass, pass this around to show that I actually was in the Navy. I'm I down think he's on the, on the right bottom, seat. way over on the bottom. On the right seat. Bottom, what would it be? I, I was young. I was young. Right, yeah. Can you right. tell that? Yeah. <laughs> good. What's, what's one thing, you know, if you wanted to, if you wanted folks this age to know about the war, what's, what would that one thing be? Well, I think that America, the United States, is the greatest nation in the world. And I don't know that we can afford to be the peacekeeper of the world, but we are. And uh, I, I, I don't know that we have really wanted that role, but we, we have it. So under that role, I think we have to understand that there are a lot of people in this world that aren't happy with the United States. And uh, we'll always be. But I, I think uh, World War II was ne absolutely necessary. And I don't know if we had any choice. Are you proud to serve? Yes. I don't, I don't like to talk about it. This is the first time I've ever talked about some of the experiences. Well, I appreciate you coming. Um, you know, I served in the Navy four years, peacetime Navy, oh, you but did? it is, and I was at Subic and Coronado and all, a lot, some of the same places. And those are the four most important years in my, in my life in some ways, and just my development as a person. I imagine being in the military in wartime, it's even more so. You know, those years, in some ways, the most important years of your life, yeah. just in shaping who you are. Yeah. How did you, what's one way you went into the war and then you came out of the war? How were you different when you came out of the war? Well, of course, I was already a family man when I went into the service. And I had just graduated from college. And I think uh, the experiences I had in the war really matured me to realize how precious life is and how concerned you should be about your fellow man. And I think you get a new conviction of, uh, of the future. I, I, 
I had a friend that, that uh, was a dentist, had quite a bit of money, and he he bought, uh, he wanted to buy a Coca-Cola bottling plant in Jefferson, Missouri, at, uh, not yet, uh, Columbia, Missouri. And he tried to get me after that at the board to, to come up there. If I'd run it, he'd give me half interest. And he, he uh, later sold that or the people that he was about to buy it from so they sold it for $14 million dollars at home of the University of Missouri. But I told Bill, I said, Bill, while I was in the service, I made a commitment to him. I was needed at JDU, I was going to spend my life there. So, <coughs> that's been my commitment that for 31 years, in case some of you didn't know, I, I was your president here. And, uh, kind of felt like I gave my life to serve this college. And that commitment was made when you were in service? Yeah. It's, it's yeah, that was. I have, I said two more questions three questions ago, but I have two okay. more. Okay. And you said a minute ago that um, you're proud of your service, but you don't like to talk about it. Well, explain that. Well, I think there's experiences you have in your life They're memories you really don't want to dwell on or rehash. You know, like, I, I, there's some things that happened during the war that I, I, I won't mention. But you have you have a certain experience, and you just do not talk about it. If, uh, if you write a check and it's overdrawn, and you want to cover it and not not talk about it anymore. I don't know how, what kind of an example it would be, but that, that's kind of the way I feel about it. And I'm proud that I, I'm proud that I was in the service and I was in the Navy. Anybody want to ask a question real quick before I ask my last one? Yeah, was there ever a time that you thought you wouldn't win or didn't really just percent sure we we're going to win? Oh yeah, I, I felt like it was. We, we had the power and we had the organization, we had the equipment. Did you know when you were in the service that Japan really is a small resource poor nation that simply didn't have the economy to sustain oh, yeah. us? Yeah, that. we were aware that they, they were a weak nation. It wasn't going to, it, it wouldn't take long. It, it, it was a long way from our shoulder, but eventually we be there. Anybody want to ask another question before I ask another? <coughs> uh, the last question is I always want to give Vince a chance to honor um, someone who didn't come back, and I'm just wondering if there's someone that you remember, out of the memory of someone who didn't come back, but if there's someone that you know, maybe someone from the JVU campus, who didn't come back, yeah. and if you could tell us his name and a little bit about him. Uh, Victor Spivey was a friend of mine who was in class together, and Victor went into uh, uh, the Army. I, I don't know if he drafted or whether he volunteered, but he was in the assault at Normandy. And uh, for a long time they, 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 they never, they didn't find him until I guess maybe a year later he was killed. And his folks lived here. <coughs> and his, uh, his, uh, his, his, uh, uncle was our registrar here at the college and he was just a fine young man a good friend of mine how old was he he must have been uh 18 or 19 when he went in and so he went in with the first wave of normandy yeah his, they didn't find his body because he was in the water i guess i don't know and yeah, they were, they, his, he wasn't reported uh dead until i think it was five or six did the thought ever go through your mind, why did I get to come home and he did? No, I, to be honest, no, I, I, I don't know what that. Anyone else that you'd like to remember, whose name you'd like to bring up? Well, the, actually the cathedral was uh, built in memory of our boys that said, I think they got out of the cornerstone. <coughs> his building in memory of our boys didn't come home. 
I think there was something like 18 or 19 students that were killed. 18 or 19 JVU students. JVU, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Actually left out of the, the students. Okay. Well, we appreciate your time. Okay. We appreciate your service. Thank you very much. Yeah.